Earlier this year, I went on this massive five week long trip through Japan. I did plenty of scanning, so I still have a lot of pieces I'm working on, but this particular edit is a point cloud fly through of the Tokyo Sky Tree. I spent three weeks on it. And from what you saw in the thumbnail, this animation was made in Blender. So in this video, I'm going to be talking about pretty much just a breakdown of how I made the piece. It's not a tutorial and I'm not gonna go over the super advanced nodes, but you still will see some nodes as well as some other techniques and processes that I want to share. Let's just hop right into it. Throughout working on this animation, I brought in a second window. So instead of one, I had two because here I was spending a lot of time animating. And these two views are super helpful because one view I can have locked in for the camera and then the other view can just be me freely moving around to get a better view of what I'm actually doing in 3D space. If you're pretty new to Blender, you might not know why all of these numbers are showing. Pretty much that's motion paths in the object properties. It is right here underneath, obviously, motion paths. And when you click update path, anytime you change the keyframe to animation for an object, it shows its path over time. I just want to briefly mention that now, but I'll get a bit more into camera animation later in this video, so stick around. But let's start off with the base mesh. Let's show the node setup for that. So I have a bit of shading set up here. I'll get to that in a second. But as for just the base mesh, well, right now it is being shown as a point cloud. But if I disable it, you can see that we started off with a mesh. All of this data was pulled from Google Maps using the Blender Blossom plugin, which is right here. I go more into detail about how to use Blossom and my workflow for it in my point cloud course, because it does involve extra steps with tiling as well as merging the textures because point clouds only work with a single material unless you want to have a headache with managing thousands of materials. Pretty much simple three node setup. One is setting up the points. Next one is setting the point size and then setting the material. As for the material, if we hop in here, we can see it is pretty complex. So I'm going to go part by part so it's simpler to understand. Over here, I use some vector math to isolate the sky tree, especially the core as well as just the sky tree itself to apply some special shading just to the sky tree. And over here, then there's some more masks just to refine it. So you can see that there are a few steps in the mask creation process. And this was done with just math nodes separating X, Y, Z's and some map ranges. And the reason why I did that is because I had two special shaders for my point cloud shaders pack that I wanted to add to the sky tree and just isolate the sky tree and not add it to the whole point cloud without this mask. If I disable this node, you can see that it will be applied to the whole point cloud, which is not what I wanted. So that mask was there just for isolating. Same thing with Twinkle, which is another shader for my point shaders, which gives twinkling points. I also added a mask to that because without it, it would pretty much just show on the entire point cloud. Then I mixed in the shader with the texture with my metallic and roughness set to these values, which is my signature look. And then one sneaky thing I did is I also added in a rim light by using point cloud normals. If you see up here in geometry nodes, I grabbed the distribute points on faces normal, plugged it into the output and made a custom attribute. This is how the raw value looks like. And that way we're able to get a Fresnel on a point cloud with it disabled. We would just get the Fresnel on the individual points. Kind of tough to show each individual point, but you can see without the normal, we're just getting Fresnel shaded per pixel versus shaded per point. And this is a similar technique to what I use in my point shaders, where it's very important to know the difference between per pixel shading and per point shading, especially when working with point clouds. With it on and off, it's very subtle, but it does help highlight it more. Shading is just half of the equation. Now let's talk about lighting, because when it comes to point clouds, you can do a lot of stylization in geometry nodes as well as in shading. But to really sell things, you have to have great lighting as well. So I added a bunch of lights. So let's hide this animated camera for now. And you can see that I added a bunch of lights to the spire itself. If I actually hide these, 
you can see how much of a difference it really makes because with the lights gone it just takes away all the illumination from the sky tree i didn't really have a mission texture that i could map in shading this had to be done in lighting to really sell the look now to figure out what looks good and what doesn't in art, it does take some experience, but there are some laws that you can't ignore. And one of those things is complementary colors. So the entire scene was blue for the most part, but I was orange because of my skin tone. But I really wanted the orange color to pop, so I believe on one of the lights pointed near me, it was slightly orange, which really just makes me separated from the background because without it you can see how big of a difference it really is so i needed those lights lights essentially in 3d or any art form guides the eye whatever's brighter is what the eye lands on so you want to make sure that things are properly lit whatever you want to bring attention to make sure it's bright unless you're going for some other technique which is negative space i don't want to make this video too much into art theory but if you want your art to look good start paying attention more to lighting next now let's look up to the sky you notice that we have clouds we have light and then we also have a horizon line this actually isn't an hdri this is a custom world shader that i made let's jump into that world shader when it comes to just the ambient light it's simply just the color gray but then I use a mix shader on top of it that has a light path. So pretty much it is casting a light, gray light, but it's not visible to the camera. And this is a technique I like to use. I also use this in my point shaders for some additional effects, but this light path node, super clutch to know if you're getting into more advanced stuff with Blender. But that was just the first part. So I have the atmosphere, which is this right here. I also added stars and then also clouds so let's just if you guys want to <laughs> copy that i don't really care if someone steals this you can take a look at all of these nodes and if you're too lazy to copy these nodes i'll just make it a gumroad product for free i'll have it linked below although i have it linked for free if you find it of great value then a tip would be appreciated so between the atmosphere the stars and then the clouds there was some multiply nodes the one thing about these clouds that are different than your typical noise shader, the magic sauce to make these clouds look convincing is a divide node in separate XYZ. Without it, you get no horizon line, but with this math node set to divide, you get an artificial horizon line. I discovered this and it really is a game changer when it comes to building out world shaders in just shading without using HDRIs. I also chopped off the bottom with this math right here just to make sure that the clouds and the stars are only on the top half and then just bringing it all together and then the final result. If I didn't have that ambient gray light that we have here, you can see that the whole scene would look dark, but with it, it just gives a ambient light level that didn't involve any additional lights for the rest of the scene. If we go back here into shaded or rendered view, you can see without it, everything kind of just looks too dark, too punchy, but by adding that grayness, we're getting some of the additional color. What next? One of the most important and signature things about my animations are the camera animations. Matter of fact, this three week animation, it took me three weeks on and off. Most of the time spent creating this was with the camera animation and going back to this motion path, one of the ways how I really helped enhance my stuff is by visualizing the motion paths. Because if you see a bunch of points kind of scrunched up together, or transitioning in an awkward way, it makes it clear that the animation will come off looking awkward and unnatural. So that was a very big discovery when it came to this animation. I animated it with a path, which I'm going to show right now. So this is a curve and I spent a bunch of time making sure this was right. One thing that's different about this piece than my older ones is that the camera's speed changes over time. It's not just a constant speed. So I have the offset for the follow path constraint animated and it progresses at different rates over time. You can see sometimes it slows down. Sometimes it's a steady speed. Sometimes it almost stops and then launches. And that's a look that I really 
liked to implement. It was really fun to implement and also it just looks great on camera. And once we reach near the top, I transitioned from a path animation just to keyframes. So all of this is just keyframes near the end. And another thing, if you notice from the start, I made this transition where it turns from real world footage to a digital twin. One thing that I love doing for starting off my animations when it comes to real world places is lining up the camera of real life captured footage with the 3D counterpart to make this particle dissolve transition. Before I forget, here's the particle transition. This setup is pretty advanced, so I'm not gonna go into the node setup for this. But this is a simulation node setup that hides the original footage from on top and also has a particle animation. So you just have a clear transition. So you can clearly see this transition from real world footage to point cloud. The way this workflow works is you have two cameras. So the tracked footage is attached to cam underscore tracked. And I use Geo Tracker for that. And then I have an animated camera. How this is done is I have the tracked data from Geo Tracker, and my animated camera is constrained onto the tracked camera. And then over time, it slowly transitions into the animated camera. This particular bit is a little bit complicated, but essentially, it's just taking the Google Maps data and tracking that with the real life footage. Sometimes I use Google Maps data, other times it's 3D scans that I captured myself. But the workflow is the same because you have a digital twin, it's a real life counterpart in the digital world, you're able to transition flawlessly. Now I'm gonna rapid fire through some more stuff that I am really wanna show off behind the scenes what I did here. I figured out a workflow for getting flowing points on a moving character, as you can see here. And this is a two-step setup of simulation. So we have our base character where the points are flowing on the character. But then I also figured out a workflow where I get the flowing points moving on an animated character. This took a lot of time to figure out, right? Uh, and what I really like about it is that I have uh, full control after the fact so I can repose or reanimate the character. This is one of my first times animating characters. I'm kind of bad with it, honestly. I used motion capture, but then I did some cleanup on top of it. I used the NLE and it was such a headache to work with. There were like things that just broke the animation for reasons that I don't even know why, but I finally got it working. This is a 3D scan of myself at a 3D capture studio, so a bunch of cameras took a picture at the same time and that came out a 3D model of me. And then this is just a luggage that I scanned. I used an app called Kiri Engine. They do sponsor me for my short form content, but they're not paying me to say this for this video. They actually have a free tier. So if you want to try the app out for yourself, then give it a shot. This isn't the raw scan though. I did some retopology as well as some mesh cleanup to make it usable for future edits as well. And I did this flowing point setup on the luggage as well. The additional setup is this simple kind of like circular ring of points. And this is a pretty simple setup. You got the geometry stuff on the right. So it was only three nodes. And then you have this simple Shader node setup with a scene time node. This is actually part of my point shaders. I ported over the scene time node from geometry nodes. You don't normally have it in the default blender out the box, a scene time, scene time node and shading, but I made a custom node setup for that. And with this setup, it is a rotating point, kind of looks like a loading screen type animation. That's how the real Sco Tokyo Sky Tree has it. So that's why I included it twice. And then on top for the spire, this was my favorite part to animate, but for the spire effect, I had some simulation setups for point clouds as well as some beacon. This is actually the only mesh in the entire animation. Everything else is made entirely of point clouds. So this was its own geometry node setup, then also another beacon effect. In my older stuff, I would kind of be one and done and not iterate on things, but now I really have been iterating a lot. And to sell this, I use multiple elements. You have the main beacon, but then also some additional particle effects. It really does help when you merge several effects together it just makes the effect look a lot more polished and finished. Throughout my time creating this, I was always asking myself, is it ready? What else can I change? What can I add? And that also does just come with experience when you let the work sit and breathe, and then you could come back to it and just by second nature, know what you need to add to make the piece polished. And I just love this part so much because between the camera animation, 
that intensifies near the end with some shake as well as that final blast it's such a intense finish to this fly through and i lo just love ev it makes everything easy to preview in real time i remember when i first started working on point clouds we didn't have ev for point clouds but now we do and then the last thing is i have the look of speed lines this is actually a node setup that i found on blender market and i really needed this because without it especially in the part where i launch up Without it, it would just look like I'm not really going anywhere, but with the dust, it really does sell it. It's just a great visual indicator to enhance speed. You see it in video games, you see it in anime. So I was like, oh, let me see if I can include it in my animation. So I did exactly that. Fun little fact, it actually has no material. It's literally the default Blender material, but it worked, so I just kept it at that. After that, I brought everything into After Effects. Then I also did my own voice acting for myself, but then I had an additional character that spoke Japanese. I used 11 labs for that. And I know some people hate when artists use AI. My stance on that is AI augments creativity. It's not here to replace creativity. I know that there's a percentage of people that have a strong opinion on AI, but whatever I can use to help my animation I'm going to use AI without it taking my style away. I then brought that voice into Ableton. This is my first time using Ableton. And apparently in Ableton, it's called automations, not keyframes. And I did this bit crusher type effect to make it sound retro. And I was just playing around with that, had fun with it. And I had this dialogue box pop up that I animated in After Effects as well. And then pretty much After Effects Premiere Pro was where the sound design and final compositing took place. One last thing I want to say is I also rendered an EXR. If you're not using EXR, definitely take some time to learn how to use EXR because it really does make a difference, especially when your animations start getting more advanced and you're working with multiple render layers and i think i covered nearly everything i wanted to talk about when it came to this animation maybe i forgot a thing or two or maybe not but i don't want this video to drag out too long because it would be several hours if i talked about everything it took to make this animation two ways to support me the first is point shaders so if you want to level up the shading of your point clouds inside blender you could grab that one there still is an early bird discount for that and then if you want to learn my point cloud animation workflow from start to finish, I have my flagship course regarding that. You got 20 plus something, how many lessons? 20, 20, 25, I don't even remember myself. Let me check. The Blender point cloud course. Yeah, we got 25 lessons. That's one of the best ways to support me. You really get to learn the nitty gritty of geometry nodes and vector math logic. In the course, I also touch about lighting, shading, compositing. So regardless of your skill level, if you're an expert, you'll learn a thing or two. And if you're a beginner, it can really lay the foundation for starting off with Blender. Strongly suggest checking the course out. And I understand that there's always people looking for free stuff. If you're one of those, you can always just go on my Instagram as well as check out my YouTube. Be sure to subscribe. I have more resources. That being said, you made it to the end of the video, but I don't just do Blender content. Sometimes I interview artists. Sometimes I talk about art. So if you're into that, be sure to subscribe and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.